strangers to God, we are without hope. If we are strangers to God, we have no hope. The Gentiles were walking, breathing, living definitions of hopelessness. They were ignorant to the ways of God. They were unaware of the promises of God. They didn't understand the word of God. And because of this, they lacked hope in their lives. And life was simply a vicious cycle, believing that everything that, that has been will simply be again. There's no goal. There's no, nothing to strive for. There's nothing to reach for. If you have no hope, you have no reason to carry on, right? Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 says that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This describes the life that the Gentiles had to face. Life can be cruel sometimes, right? Life can present us times when we feel completely and utterly alone. No one to turn to. Nowhere to go. No one to pray to. You can't find rest. You can't find peace. And this is, this is life before Christ. At that time, when you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You didn't, you didn't have access to peace. You didn't have access to power. You didn't have access to the Spirit. Amen. Ignorant, unaware, unable. This is life without Christ. Hopelessness stems from being without God in the world. The word commonwealth here means citizenship. Aliens from the citizenship of Israel. There was no way that you could have access to the things that a citizen of Israel could have access to. That was you and I before Christ. As strangers to God, we had no ability to help ourselves. Nations and people, if you remember back to the Roman Empire, to be a Roman citizen was a coveted position. There were rights that you had as a Roman citizen that no one else, if you weren't a citizen, had. You could vote. You could sue. You could go to court. You could defend yourself. These were the rights of Roman citizens. If you were a Roman citizen, you were, uh, there were certain forms outside of, I believe it was treason. Uh, if you were convicted of treason, capital punishment uh, could be applied. But outside of that, if you were a Roman citizen, you were exempt from certain punishments even under Roman law as, as a citizen. This is... This is, this is what we're talking about here this morning, commonwealth of Israel, the citizenship of Israel. As strangers to God, we had no ability to help ourselves. We weren't a citizen. We didn't, we didn't have rights. We didn't have, there were certain things that we couldn't access because we weren't citizens. Strangers from the covenant of promise. Without a relationship with God, we have none of his resources. Now, we know that God is unlimited, we know that God is omnipotent, that he's omniscient, that he's omnipresent. We know that he has no uh, limit to his resources, but if we're not in relationship with God, we don't have access to his resources. We, we could desire the blessings of citizenship all we want to, but without that relationship, we have no rights. We have no ability to acquire them for ourselves. We are, we are truly alone in the world. And this is life before Christ. But fortunately, thankfully, our new citizenship provides great benefits. We like benefits, don't we? We like, we like benefits. When, when, I, uh, when I started uh, working for the company that I'm working for, uh, one of the things that I asked for in, in the hiring process was I asked if normally there's a 90-day waiting period to access your benefits, your extended health and your medical and all of that. And I asked them to waive the 90-day waiting period uh, as part of my hire. And thankfully, they agreed to. Why? I, I, I wanted those benefits. I needed those benefits. 
And fortunately for us, when we become citizens of heaven, when we become uh, in covenant relationship with God, our new citizenship provides us some fantastic benefits. We're no longer without Christ. We're no longer aliens. We're now citizens. And guess what? Citizens have rights. When you're not a citizen, you don't have certain rights. But now we're no longer aliens and strangers, but we are heirs of God's kingdom. The promises that God had given to Israel in his covenant relationship with them, when we enjoyed ourselves in relationship to God, we have access to the same benefits. We have access to the same promises. We become a part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is greater than any nation or country. It's greater than any political power that's ever existed. Amen. Here on earth. And this is the kingdom that we are now a part of. And the king of our kingdom is not just any king, but he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Amen. And he gives us great benefits. Long before Jesus Christ came and died at Calvary, Rahab looked to the people of God and understood the value of being a citizen of being a Jew. At that time, the people of God didn't have land of their own. They didn't have a city. They didn't have uh, a natural kingdom. They lived in tents. They were a nomadic people. They went from camp to camp. But even still, there was something about the Jews, and the nation of Israel that Rahab saw. And Rahab believed the God of the Hebrews and believed that the God of the Hebrews would give the nation of Israel the city in which she lived. So even before the victory had been obtained, Rahab believed in the power of being a part of God's chosen people. Amen. What faith. What faith. And this is ultimately where we're going next. Our our new citizenship comes through faith. Rahab's story perfectly illustrates what saving faith looks like. Because Rahab was in a situation where there was no hope. Israel was coming, and Israel was going to conquer her city. She didn't have a hope, but she believed. She had faith. And her faith is what led her to plead with the two spies for her very life and for the lives of her family. Little did she know what God would do for her because not only did God spare Rahab's life, but if you trace the lineage back, the Bible would tell us that Rahab was the great-great-grandmother of David. Of course, David was in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So Rahab's life literally foreshadowed the spiritual access that would be made for all of us today as Gentiles. As a Gentile, Rahab was without hope in the world, with no access to the promises of God, yet through faith she believed in God, and that gave her hope. You can read about this in Joshua chapter 2, verse 18. This is the spies speaking to Rahab. They said, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. What are they saying? They're saying, Anyone who's in your house, Rahab, is going to be spared when we come and conquer the city. The line of scarlet thread was the way of escape for the spies, and it would also become the way of escape for Rahab and her entire family. And this is interesting because the Bible says, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread. If you look at the Hebrew word for line, it's the the word tikva. And this word means rope, which is what it was. But it possesses another meaning as well. It could also be interpreted expectation. Expectation or hope. Literally something that I am expecting, something that I am 
longing for, something that I am hoping for. This is what this word could be interpreted as. This is what this word means. So when we come into the land, Rahab, you're going to bind this hope. You're going to bind this expectation, amen, in your window. And this was the means by which Rahab received her salvation. And it's no coincidence that this word was chosen, amen. It, rec it, it, it represented Rahab's hope. And you and I share in this story of Rahab this morning, because just like Rahab was saved by her faith, amen, we also are saved through faith, amen. Jesus provided our salvation through his blood. He is our scarlet thread, amen. Jesus changed everything when he came and died for our sins. He purchased our ability and our opportunity to have citizenship. If Jesus didn't come and didn't do what he did, you and I would still be lost and without hope today. Amen. You and I would still be wandering in a, in a desperate world of fear and anxiety. And we would have no hope, no access, no rights. We would be ignorant to the promises of God, ignorant to the presence of God, ignorant to the spirit of God. Jesus changed everything. Amen. He changed everything. Sin had created this great gulf between man and God, but thankfully, oh, I'm so thankful this morning, the blood of Jesus Christ bridged that gap. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ purchased salvation for you and for me. And I'm thankful that Jesus came and died and shed his blood. I'm thankful that he was buried, but I'm really thankful that he didn't stay in the grave, but he, that, he, that he rose again. Amen, on the third day, victorious, because that's what gives us victory. That's what gives us overcoming power. Amen, that's what enables us when we're filled with his spirit, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, amen, can quicken our mortal bodies. And now we're adopted. We're adopted children this morning, all of us. Amen. Adopted into God's family through the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, all of the privileges, all of the rights, all of the promises to citizenship or to citizens and through citizenship are available to us. Amen. Are available to us. And we're going to talk a little bit about these privileges. We have been brought near to God. Amen. We have been brought near to God. We ought to be thankful every day that we can walk with the Lord. Amen. We can walk with him every single day. Why? Because we've been washed in his blood. Because we've been sanctified by his spirit. And we've been given through this process of salvation unlimited access to God, to his presence, to his power, and to his spirit. Amen. I'm so thankful today. Talking about our position in Christ. The redemption of Jesus Christ possesses the power to break any barrier, no matter how strong that barrier may appear to be, no matter how long that barrier may have been in existence. Because of the redemption of Jesus Christ, he possesses, and by extension, we possess the power to break any barrier. But this can only be accomplished when we are in Christ Jesus. Guess what? If you're in Christ Jesus, you're going to be near to God. You can't be in him and be distant and afar off. And if we're not in Christ Jesus, he's the only way that this is going to work. He's the only one that can give us that power today. And the blood's power to make nigh those who were afar off can only work if the believer is in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the mediator. Jesus is the one who goes between. He's the one who, by his death, purchased access to these privileges, to all of these wonderful things for us as Gentiles as well as the Jewish people. 
he didn't just die for the covenant people. He died for everyone. He died for all, even those who were afar off. Isaiah prophesied in chapter 57, verse 19, he said, I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Amen. It wasn't just for the Jews. It was never just for the Jews. Amen. And here we are today, sitting and standing in the presence of the Lord, having been brought near to God, amen, because of what Jesus Christ came to do for you and I. Another benefit of this new citizenship that we have in in relation to our position in Christ is that we have peace, not just for ourselves, not just within ourselves, but we have peace with others. We have peace with others. Peace is a a very lacking characteristic in our world today. And not just peace within, but people are at ought with one another. And one of the characteristics that we need to have as Christians is we need to have, and we do have through Christ, the ability to have peace not just in our own lives, but when
We must overcome the world. Our position in Christ is not one of defeat. God hasn't called us to be defeated. God hasn't destined us to defeat. But God has given us victory. God has given us destiny. God has given us life. God has given us not just any life, but he's given us abundant life. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So we must overcome the world. First John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, If you want to see the kingdom, you have to be born again, right? Of water and born again of spirit. And John said, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, he said, that overcomes the world. What is it? Even our faith, amen, as citizens of this country, as citizens of, of the kingdom of God, amen, our faith enables us to be an overcomer, amen. Our faith is what propels us to the destiny that God has provided and planned for us. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30 and 31, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And it was by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. So just as it was in Rahab's life, in the same way, it is through our faith, it is by faith that Christ will dwell in our hearts and will be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. And the extent to, to which Christ indwells in us depends upon the level to which we allow him to develop our faith. We need to put our faith in action. We need to put our faith uh, in action. It's not just the initial act of believing the gospel. It's not even the uh, only the act of obeying the plan of salvation through repentance and baptism and the infilling of the Spirit. But it's our faith in action in the sense of it's a life-long and a life-changing process. Amen. It's a life-changing experience and an ongoing process. Faith is a decision where we tell ourselves, God, and others that we've decided that we're going to take up our cross and we're going to follow him. We're going to commit ourselves to the principles of his word. We're going to be obedient to the word of God. We're going to live according to the faith that we have. Amen. And we're going to do it and be an overcomer through the spirit of God that God has deposited in us. Through love, a person can become rooted and receive the nourishment that's needed to continue growing in the Lord. Love is the foundation. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that God is love. Without love, our desire to claim what Christ has made available will only result in our consuming these blessings according to our own desires. We like what we feel. God bless me. God do this for me. God answer my prayer. I need this. I need that. But when we have love, it's, Lord, look at the lost. Look at the hurting. Look at the broken. Let me love them. And we need the true love of God to eliminate the self-centeredness that is so pressed upon us by our society and replace it with a firm foundation, that, that foundation that we read about earlier in, our, earlier in our lesson. Amen. God, build my life in such a way that my life can be a reflection of you to all those who would see me. Amen. So now, we have to live the promise. Amen. We have to live the promise. God never forces himself on anyone. He never, he never intrusively pushes himself into our lives. He simply makes the promise available. And then he gives us the power if we will receive it. 
and he leaves it up to you and I to decide. What are we going to do? Are we going to live out his promises for us? He has a victory. He has a destiny. He has, he has a plan and a will. Are we going to embrace that? Are we going to be obedient to it? Because we have an opportunity to become a part of the story. Would you stand together with me this morning? Last scripture today. Very familiar scripture says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Anyone have the power in you today? Amen. Anyone have the power working in your life today? But why don't we lift our hands this morning and let's thank the Lord for what he's done in our lives, the position that he's given us in Christ. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful today. Thankful for your spirit. Thankful for the work, Lord, of grace in our lives. We're thankful, Lord, for faith, faith in your word today. Faith, Lord Jesus, that you can do what you've said that you would do. God, we're so grateful for your presence. We're thankful, Lord, for this opportunity. God, you haven't given us just a, a minor role to play, but you have given us a prominent position in you today. And I pray that we would rise to accept it and rise to fulfill it. Let us embrace the promises. Let us embrace the, the, the wonderful blessings, but God, let us also embrace the responsibility. Let us embrace the calling that you've placed on our lives. And then, Lord, let us go and live that promise. Let us demonstrate, Lord, your love. Let us demonstrate to a lost and dying world without hope, God, that you love them unconditionally. And just as you've blessed us and helped us and saved us, so, Lord, do you want to help them, bless them, and save them? We thank you, Lord, today. Be with us the rest of this day, we pray. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you today. In Jesus' name.
Amen. God is good, isn't he? Amen. God is good. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful today to be together in your house. Lord, worshiping and praising your holy name. We ask, Lord, that throughout the process of this service, the course of the next few minutes, Lord, let our spirits be open. Let our hearts be open. Let our minds be open, Lord. God, let us bind together in unity and praise and worship. And I pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people today as we praise you and as we worship you, as we give you glory and magnify your name, Lord. Let your will be done today, we pray. We give you praise and glory for it. We worship you and exalt you today, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Why don't we clap our hands together in praise to the King of Kings. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God will reign forever, and all the world will know me to stay. Everyone together, sing the song of the redeemed. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what he did. My Savior, my Savior. trembles at his name victory forever is the song of the redeemed oh, oh. I know that my redeemer lives and now I stand on what he did my savior my savior lives every day a brand new chance to
Aren't you glad he's alive today? Oh, let's clap our hands to the Lord one more time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. God bless you. you. May be seated for a few moments. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. I came to worship the Lord today. And uh, for those upstairs and downstairs and those that are online today, it's just wonderful to know the Lord Jesus. It's just great to be a child of the King today. Amen. I want to quickly just talk about our announcements today. Uh, this is Youth Emphasis Sunday, and uh, we're getting back into our regular sync. And uh, wonderful to have our young people involved today. Amen. And uh, on the calendar that you receive for the month of October, it says that this Thursday is open. But that event has been moved to next week. So there will be church on Thursday night here. Say, there will be church. Amen. There will be church. Our Oasis service is designed, amen, so that we can come in out of a busy week into the presence of the Lord and uh, be refreshed and renewed and, and have his word speak into our lives. Amen. So minister's retreat that was scheduled, the minister's virtual retreat was scheduled for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week is now Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the next week. So next week, the next week after this week uh, is that event, and then we will have the open evening then. And, uh, and Saturday, of course, 7 o'clock, praise and prayer. Wonderful to be able to come together and worship the Lord and pray and seek God. Amen. Get our hearts ready for another great weekend. Saturday night, don't forget, you move your clocks backward. Amen. You were complaining in the spring when you had to move it forward. Well, this is where you get it all back. Amen. So if you get here early, early for church, you forget, just go ahead and have a good time. We'll catch up to you in just an hour. Amen. Amen. Is that all right? And then, uh, and then uh, Sunday morning, of course, pastor's prayer at 7 in the morning, and then another wonderful uh, weekend services. Amen. It's so glad to see Moises come in with his family. They, of course, uh, he had not had his family with him in the immigration process for several months. And then he went home for a little bit and come back, and it's been several more months. The COVID thing kind of messed everything up. We're so glad. Uh, maybe, Moses, why don't you just stand and introduce your family? Hello. <laughs> Amen. We've been praying about this for a while. It's good to see them, meet them, and be in the house of the Lord together. Amen. And I could tell there's a big smile on Moises' face. <laughs> Amen. God is so good. And uh, we want to just uh, quickly uh, go to our prayer focus uh, for this week. This week we are praying for uh, a, uh, a unchurched city right now. We have none of our churches in this city, the city of Vernon. 
beautiful city just uh, just a little bit north of uh, Kelowna and uh, beautiful beautiful place we have had a church there before but right now there is no assembly we're going to stand together and we're going to pray for this city amen that God will uh, again lay it on somebody's heart to go and plant a church amen and that we can go with them in prayer and believe that God will do a great work. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that God wants everybody to hear the gospel? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you today. God, for your goodness, oh God. We thank you today, Lord, that you care more about souls even than we do, oh God. And Lord, it's your passion today that not any should perish. We pray, God, for this city that needs, Lord, a a lighthouse of truth today, a city that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray, God, that you would open, Lord, the doors and that you would honor the seed that has already been planted there. Oh, God, and let, Lord, your work go forward today. Lord, I pray today, Jesus, that you would do this work through your powerful, wonderful name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus, thank you for this day, and we thank you for the offering that these people are going to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to march around as we do, coming down one way and going back the other, observing social distances. He became sin. might become his righteousness he humbled himself carried the cross love so amazing love so
our voice and our hands to the Lord this morning. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. service we are also doing our annual youth cheese for christ bake sale auction after church so stick around for that um, we have a bunch of baked goods that we're going to be auctioning off for sheets for christ 
as the way COVID happened this year, we have already kind of passed that time. So our church did make a faith um, uh, pledge for our Sheets of Christ. But for those of you who don't know, Sheets of Christ is our annual youth fundraiser that we do to raise money for the different youth activities we do not only here uh, locally, but also internationally. And it goes to support many different um, many different things. One of those that is very important is a, a program called Wheels on the Gospel, where we buy four-wheel drive vehicles for missionaries to get to places where they normally could not go. Um, there's various children's homes, orphanages, and uh uh, Lighthouse Ranch for Boys is another one, Tupelo Children's Ranch. So we want to, of course, make sure that we are able to honor that pledge. And why not have some baked goods while we're doing it? And we usually have a lot of fun with this. So stick around after service today for that. <clears throat> and if you didn't bring cash, modern society has allowed us to do um, e-transfers. And, of course, we can also take pledges and you can get that in over the next couple of weeks. I think we have till the end of November to get the money in, Dad? The church has? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's good to be in youth service today. It doesn't matter what your age is, though. We're happy to be in the house of the Lord and be together and to support our young people. <clears throat> today, I'm going to be reading out of uh, the book of Exodus. Um, start in uh, chapter 12, verses 50 and 51. And it says, Thus did all the children of Israel and the Lord commanded Moses... And Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. And in verse 13, sorry, chapter 13, verse 14. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this thou shalt say unto him? By the strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt from the house of bondage. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being here with us today. Lord, we ask that this just be your word, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to our hearts today. We thank you for what you are doing here in this church, Lord, and through our young people. We praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> you may be seated. <clears throat> so for 400 years, over 400, 430 years, the Israelites had been in Egypt. For the majority of that time, they had been enslaved by the Egyptians. After Joseph had been sold himself into slavery initially, Things got better for him, uh, and they got worse, and they got better, and then slowly he became the second most powerful man in Egypt, and God used him to rescue Egypt from a famine that was going to plague the land. But eventually, the Egyptians started to fear as the Israelites grew and grew in number, and they were they feared that they would take over their land, so they forced them into slavery, into bondage. They wanted to control over them so they wouldn't lose what was theirs. Finally, the day had come, I'm oh, sorry, like any people forced into slavery, they wanted out. They wanted their freedom. I have never had that happen to me, but I can only imagine and having seen different points throughout history and stories, when somebody is forced into servitude, they are generally, their dream is to get out of it any way possible. They want out. They do not want to be held in captivity. Well, finally, after 430 years, the day had come. Moses had spent quite a long time trying to get the Pharaoh to agree to letting the Israelites free from Egypt. I think most of us are pretty familiar with the story. It's quite a long story. But what had, what had happened with the ten plagues that ended with the deaths of all the firstborn males in Egypt, including the Pharaoh's son, Pharaoh asked Moses and Aaron to take the Israelites and to leave Egypt. Enough had been enough. Pharaoh wanted them gone. So now the Israelites have fled. Egypt is behind them. And as they had all been born in Egypt, because none of them were over 400 years old, this was the first time any of them had ever known freedom. How sweet it must have been to have left all the horrors and atrocities behind them. No more forced labor, no more slavery and bondage. This is what they had always desired for. This is what they had dreamed of. As they were walking out, I can only imagine what they must have felt. We're free. We are our own people. We're no more being told what to do. We're going to follow God. We're going to leave here. It must have been excitement. There must have been a, 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 bit, a bit of joy. They finally were free for the moment. Exodus 13, verses 3 to 5 says, And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day. 
in which ye came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall be no leavened bread be eaten this day ye came out of the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. So they're free. God had provided them with freedom with a promise of a future. A land promised to be their own, a land that would flow with milk and honey. I mean, it must have been a scary thought to leave everything they had ever known, but it was oppression, it was slavery, it was bondage they wanted out, and not only did they have a way out, they had a place to go. As they wandered in the wilderness, they eventually came to a place by the Red Sea where they camped. You see, the land that they had been promised was beyond this sea. So as they, were, as they were moving through and they're coming up to the land and they're probably thinking as the, the ocean rose up out of the, in the distance, thinking, well, we obviously got somewhere. We have to go somewhere. What's, what's going on? We, we have something in front of us. And, well, you know, Moses is leading us. Let's just follow him. Let's see where he's taking us. And I'm sure there was murmurings. <clears throat> in Exodus 14, verses 1 through 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pi-Haroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal-Zephon, before, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. So now they're being told, you will camp here. For Pharaoh will say unto the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and his heart, and the heart of Pharaoh, and of his servants, was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot, and he took people with him. And he took six hundred chosen chariots, and all of the chariots of Egypt, and the captains of every single one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a, a, a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and the army overtook them in camping by the sea beside pi Heroth. and before baal Savan. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, And because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. No, no, that's quite a bit of scripture to get through, but... The basis of that is, is they were marching. God told Moses, you guys are going to camp here by the sea. You're going to set up camp. You're going to wait. Because God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh now decided, you know what? We let them go. Why did we do that? Let's go after them and get them back. They belong to us. I want them back. And then when the Egyptians are bearing down upon them, and they're looking behind them towards the wilderness where the Egyptians are marching from. And they look on the other side and all they can see is the sea. And there's too many of them. Where are they to go? So they cried out unto God first, but then they, they went to Moses and they said, Why? Was there not enough room for us just to be buried in Egypt? You should have let us die there. Could you not have let us just die there in servitude? We even told you in Egypt. A few of them were, probably, were, were saying they had already forgotten how much they had wanted out of Egypt, how much that bondage and oppression had been effect on them. Even though they had recently found freedom, they had always been searching for, and they knew the joy they felt this, from this freedom. When Pharaoh and the Egyptians had them stuck against the sea, immediately the Israelites told Moses, we never should have left. What were you thinking for bringing us out of slavery and oppression? How could you? You could have just let us die there. 
God had provided freedom, a way out. What the Israelites didn't realize is their freedom was going to be work. You see, when, when Moses was talking to Pharaoh, when the, the times of the plagues were happening and, and the Passover happened, they were all thinking, no more slavery, no more oppression, no more bondage. Land that flows with milk and honey, promised land. Everything good, nothing bad, easy street. I'm, not, I'm sure they were not expecting to have an army chasing them down, pinned up against the Red Sea right after they left Egypt. I mean, they thought, hey, we were let go easily. We didn't have to fight our way out. Egypt doesn't care. We can go. They were not expecting for this to happen. You know, sometimes we can think that we were better off in our bondage of sin because we just seem to float along and exist. We can easily forget the despair and weight of sin after God has removed it from our life because after things have been good for a while, sometimes it's a little hard to remember the despair we once felt. It's sometimes it's hard to remember how bad the oppression really was when things have been good for quite some time. Sin places us in bondage. So many people desire their freedom and they don't know a way out, but when God enters their life for the first time, they experience true freedom. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I can tell you from personal experience that there is nothing quite like the weight being lifted off of you that you didn't even totally realize you were carrying. You didn't realize how heavy it was, but when the Spirit of God enters your life, the weight that is removed because of the chains and bondage, I know we use that as a metaphor as we are not actually walking around with chains tied to our ankles, but you could actually Feel the weight of sin lift off you when the Spirit of God is in your life. Oftentimes, people experience freedom from sin. They're on a spiritual high. Things couldn't be better. Everything is great. But then adversity rears its ugly head. And obstacles seem insurmountable. It can be easy for someone to slip into the mindset of wishing they had never left their old life. Because the problem in front of me is my problem. God, the problems that's behind them, because that's behind them. You know, people often wonder why bad things could happen to them. I've heard people say, well, I'm a child of God. Why would this happen to me? What have I done wrong that God would let this happen to me? I was speaking to my site super this week about something he went through a few years ago when his wife lost their third child 32 hours after it was born. And he was talking to me about how for quite some time he was very, I mean, I won't go into the whole thing. It was, it was a very um, kind of private thing he went through. But he told me, he says, the first year I was numb, but the second year I was angry with God. It was God's fault, but then it was my fault. And he said, I was so angry. People don't always understand why bad things can happen to them. But it's not about that. Things happen. Life happens. It's not always about what we've done, good or bad. There is problems that will enter our life. Some people think, I'm a child of God. How could this happen to me? But I will remind you, the armies of, of Pharaoh did not attack the Israelites while they owned them. They owned them. They were in bondage in Egypt. They had to do what they had to do. The armies did not come to slaughter them as long as they owned them. The Israelites had forgotten God was with them when they were in Egypt. God was the one that freed them from Egypt, and he had not left them since they had departed Egypt. The enemy will not attack you when he thinks he owns you. There is no attack that will come against you because you are already in bondage of sin. The rest of uh, Exodus 14, which is quite a bit of scripture, but Starting in verse 13 to 31, it says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For he will show you today for the Egyptians, whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and he shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Remember, the sea is in front of them. But go forward. <clears throat> and
And he said, but lift up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will follow. <clears throat> and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it, be, it, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that they, the one came not near the other all the night. <clears throat> and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall upon uh, unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. And they took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. And so the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch the hand over the sea, that the waters may come again <clears throat> upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. The sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned. It covered the chariots and the horsemen, all of the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. The waters were a wall unto their right and unto their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. People feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The reason I read the entire chapter 14 today was because there's quite a bit of information in there that is very, I think is very important. The Israelites only saw an army behind them and a sea in front of them. They forgot that there was a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. They forgot that there was a God watching over them. They could only see they were in the middle of two great problems. What they neglected was God had already delivered them from the one problem. And it was chasing them down now, biting at their heels. And in front of them was a new problem. And they did not think God would see them through this new problem. Remember, when they first saw the Egyptians, they cried out to God. But then they immediately went to Moses and started complaining. It took them a split second to forget that the problem that was chasing them down had already been dealt with. It had already been taken care of once. If he could do it then, he could do it again. But is that not just human nature? God delivers us from something. We claim victory over it. We'll sing about it. We'll say, God's delivered me. I'm through it. I'm on the other side. We're happy. We're joyful. But as soon as our guard's down and those things are coming back after us, trying to take our lives again, we forget God took care of it once. And not only can he do it again, he will do it again. See, there is no problem, no vice, no snare, not anything that God cannot defeat. I remember when we were in Sunday school as a kid, we always had that one little song we always had. We would sing over again, God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. But they forgot. He had already taken care of that problem. You know what they didn't know? But God had told Moses is that he was the reason Pharaoh heart was hardened to chase after them. The sea in front of the Israelites was not even a problem. In their eyes, it was a huge problem. I can swim okay, but I can't swim an ocean across. I, can probably, I couldn't even swim a lake across. 
So when they're looking out here and they're seeing this sea, all they can see is a problem. They're stuck. It can be easy in our human nature to think something is a problem and not be able to see a way around it because our past, our old lives, our former bondage is distracting us from seeing what is in front of us. We're too busy looking back at what has already been taken care of that's already behind us to see the way forward, to trust that there is a way forward away from what's coming behind us. The thing is, what's in front of us is our path to our promised land. Maybe it may seem too big. Maybe we can't see the other side. Maybe there's no way around that we can see. But I want to point out that God did not take the Israelites around the sea. He didn't take them and turn them around to face the Egyptians. God drove them straight through the middle of what was lying in front of them. He did not only just push them through, he led them directly through the middle of the sea. This was a problem for the Israelites, but it was the path that God had set before the Israelites. This was the path they had to take. There was no way around it. There was no way under it. They had to go straight through it. God didn't help them avoid a perceived problem in their path, but he led them right through it and protected them the entire way. The water was still there, but it was a wall of protection on either side and a pillar of fire and cloud watching over them. He was the very thing they had to go through. He used that very problem, that obstacle, to destroy what was coming from their past. If you're not yet following my point is, Don't let the path God has laid out for you become the problem. Don't let the tough road ahead become the thing that drives you back into the bondage of your past. Don't look at the path laid out in front of you and said, it looks hard. I don't think I can get through it. I'm going to go back to the things of my past. Because I just existed. It was tough. There was misery. There was pain. But looking at possibles, Slaughter, I think that's easier just to go back to, just going back to how things were. We have one path to follow to our promised land. We can look at our man of God in our life. We can look at our pastor and rebuke him for ever helping bring us out of bondage, forever leading us to this path that has brought us to where we are, or we can get behind him and follow the path that God has laid out for us. There was only one way to the promised land for the Israelites, but it meant they had to go through a path that seemed uncrossable. And when we have one path to follow to our promised land, we can look forward and see that God has a way through. If we had the time, we could go throughout the entire history of Israel. And what actually got me thinking about this this week as I was praying about it, I don't know how many, I, I, I can't even count how many times Israel, they were following God, they turned away from God. They followed God, they turned away from God. Generation after generation, they were, they, were, they were believing in God and God was delivering them. And things got easy and they went back into idol worship and turned away from God. And things got tough and they went back into bondage. It might not have been the same bondage, but they went back into a form of bondage. And they turned back to God. And they slowly fell back into bondage. And things got tough. It was a repetitive process throughout their history. Time and time again, the Israelites would repeat this. Some generations would follow God. Some would turn away. Some would become enslaved. But I want to point out that the scripture we read earlier says they never saw the Egyptians again. The things that God has put in your past... The new, the new things that put you in bondage might seem the same. And the bondage is still bondage. And the sin is still sin. But when God removes something from your life, it's gone. It's gone forever. Something new might come up. And you might fall away from God. Like the Israelites did turn back away from God. But there was something new that was in bondage. That put them in bondage. God will take away our past. 
he will set us free. But we have to make sure new things don't threaten our freedom. It's so easy to fall into a snare and become trapped if we neglect to take a good look at the path we are walking on. I, um, I was actually talking with Stephanie on the way to church this morning about some people that she that some, that they do a lot of hiking in the area, and a guy who here in Chilliwack, he went and hiked Mount Shyam starting at 3.30 in the morning in the dark, and we were talking. She said, I would be too afraid to do that because I would walk right off a cliff. And the truth is, when the path is dark and you don't know your way, it would be easy for you to fall off of a cliff. It would be easy for you to fall into a hole. It would be easy for you to injure yourself or, or worse. But what do you do when you know you have to walk through the dark? You take a light. And we know many times in Scripture, Jesus described himself as a light. If you have to go through a dark path and you say, I don't know how I'm going to get through there, but there's only one way through there, you take your light. You go through there. You forge ahead because God is not going to lead you on a path that he will not see you through as long as you keep moving forward. The bondage of the past is of the past unless you turn back to it. It might come after you, but it doesn't matter because God is going to see you forward. You stand with me together today as the musicians come. So eventually God's plan unfolded and he manifested himself in flesh so that he could die upon the cross for our sins. He sacrificed so that we might see our promised land so that we could be free from the bondage of sin. What a waste of a sacrifice when people walk right back into bondage and let it take over their lives. What a waste of time it would have been for Moses to see the entire people of of Israel to turn around and say, let's go bow down back in front of Pharaoh and beg for his forgiveness and we'll go back into servitude, put us back in chains, take away the freedom. What a waste of time that would have been. What a waste of time for us to turn back to the bondage of sin after Jesus died on the cross. What a waste of sacrifice that would be. If the problem before us looks too big, And if the problem behind us seems to be chasing us down, don't look back. Look forward. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, we give the devil way too much credit for setting problems before us. Now, I know I compared that to the enemy coming after us earlier in my message. But I've heard it preached quite a few times that We do give the devil way too much credit. Because remember what the scripture said. God hardened the heart of Pharaoh because he was going to prove to the Israelites what is in your past has been taken care of. You don't believe me? Watch it now. Now it's crushed. Now it is drowned under the sea that I've used to protect you. Not every problem from us is an attack from the enemy. That's just the road ahead. The enemy is already behind us. He was already defeated. And the only way the devil has a hold over your life is if you turn around and walk back into his arms. Because there is no thing that that the devil can do or get credit for unless you let him. Because God gives us free will. But God holds all the power. Don't be scared of the path ahead. It may be unfamiliar to you. You may not see a way over it. You may not see a way around it, but God will see you all the way through it. Instead of giving up and admitting defeat, remind yourself, he set me free. He did it once. He'll do it again. We can see our promised land if we forge ahead and see Jesus, and we let God lead us. This reminds me of an old song we used to always sing, or maybe I don't know how old it is, but I remember singing it as a child. It said, once like a bird in prison I dwelt, no freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see, for glory to God, he set me free. It goes on to say, now I'm climbing higher each day. Darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground. Glory to God, I'm homeward bound. 
goodbye to sin and things that confound, not of this world shall turn me around. Daily I'm praying, I'm working to, glory to God, I'm going through. He set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see, for glory to God, he set me free. And I kept thinking of this song yesterday, because sometimes it's easy to forget how bad that prison was. Sometimes it's hard to remember that feeling of that weight lifted off of you. But if we just remember, I'm glory bound. I'm on this path. He made me a promise. And I'm going to follow that promise right to the end. If we just remember, he set me free. He is my, he is the one who let us go. He is the one that freed us and he will not let us back into captive. But it's up to us to keep moving. As we're going to sing today, I encourage you, start moving forward. Don't look back. Keep moving ahead. Keep your eyes upon Jesus as he lays the to you. Not going back to be the head here to declare to you my past is over you. Oh, let's step into the presence of the Lord this morning. Amen. Why don't we draw near to him today? Hallelujah. To Let's turn this house into a house of prayer. Hallelujah.
for the work that God's done in your life. Oh, let's give him a hand. Praise for that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 The good news is the promised land is, a, is ahead of us. The promised land is ahead of us. Praise God. Amen. We're going to have our youth bake sale auction and uh, they're going to start bringing stuff up here in just a minute. But aren't you glad to know the Lord today? Amen. Let's give our young people a great hand this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. As they're getting ready uh, to bring the stuff up, uh, just want to mention, let's remember the halls today. They're uh, with a family situation. Let's just pray that God would uh, strengthen them and be with them while they're over on the island. Amen. And let's um, remember next Sunday, I missed it in the announcements, next Sunday we have a missionary, Brother Cisco from uh, the southern part of, uh, of Africa, and he's going to be with us on Sunday, and so you won't want to miss that, so it's a mission service on Sunday morning next week, praise God, November 1st, right after you turn your clock back. Remember, it's Mission Sunday. Hallelujah. Amen. 